Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Okay, so we will begin. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name's Ruby and I'm an academic recruiter and I work for Aspen Dental Management. Um, Aspen Dental is a DSO, a dental support organization in which we support, um, ADMI supports roughly 850 offices nationwide, which is pretty awesome. Um, so we're here to support our doctors like Dr. Curry and Dr. Ransom with um, all the support outside of, you know, their clinical work and their expertise. So we're here for marketing, recruiting, um, business development, HR, anything you can think of um, so that they can focus on, you know, what they're good at and what you students will almost, are almost experts at, which is uh, dentistry. So uh, before we begin, just want to let you know that there's a question and answer little bubble box on the bottom that you guys can um, ask questions on there. Um, I also have a few questions that have been submitted prior to, so I will often be looking over here to my second monitor. Um, there's not anyone else there. It's just how I work. And um, I'll be the moderator for today. And if you do have any questions you want to ask private, privately, feel free to email me or there is the anonymous option in the question and answer box. Um, but other than that, we will begin. Um, if the doctors could introduce themselves. We'll start with um, Dr. Curry in my upper left-hand corner. So if you could introduce yourself, that'd be great. Hi, I'm Casey Curry. Um, I graduated from WVU in 2013. Um, I worked at the Clarksburg Aspen for, well, I worked for a private practice in Morgantown for about four and a half years. Um, and then I transitioned to the Clarksburg Aspen and then our Morgantown Aspen opened in December. So I am the lead dentist there currently. Awesome. Thank you. Dr. Ransom? Mm -hmm. I'm Catherine Ransom. Um, I graduated last year and I replaced Dr. Curry in Clarksburg. So I'm the associate dentist down there. But I mean, I miss her. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. You know, I guess right off the bat, you know, how did that work? Did you guys ever work together or, you know, was it a transition um, leaving and... So when she came, I actually volunteered to go cover in our Parkersburg office um, till they found a lead dentist there. So I think I, I worked with you, what, maybe a week? A week, <laughs> maybe so, two. Yeah, it, it wasn't a lot, but, um, but yeah, so I was in Parkersburg while she was training for Clarksburg. Awesome. And so Dr. Ransom, so Dr. Curry was not your mentor. Did you have a mentor coming into Aspen? So Dr. Cost is our boss um, and he has been a really great mentor for me. Um, mm -hmm. I did three weeks of training. His home office in, is in Barbersville. Um, so I did three weeks of training with him um, and I've gone down for another week of like training after working for six months and saying, hey, I want to do more. So he had me come down to the office um, to do more. Awesome. Awesome. So for the both of you, um, I will start with Dr. Curry, since you had a different journey um, coming into Aspen, you know, what options did you look into coming out of dental school and why did you end up choosing Aspen Dental? So right out of dental school, I wasn't sure where I wanted to practice at. I'm from West Virginia. I'm from um, near Morgantown. So I grew up in this area, but I ended up doing an AEGD residency down at VCU in Richmond, Virginia for one year. Um, after that, I worked at an office in South Carolina for almost a year. That was a complete disaster. Um, so I moved back home and then worked for a private practice here in Morgantown for four, four and a half years. Um, I think I wanted somewhere where I felt like I was listened to. I felt like I was, I got a lot of support. Um, I didn't really get that at the private practice that I was in. I felt like there wasn't really any room for growth as far as my clinical um, aspects. You know, there really wasn't room for me to buy in or anything like that. So. Um, I wanted somewhere where I could grow not only as a doctor, but as a clinician too. So definitely. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Ransom, what, what about you? Um, so I'm from West Virginia as well, but my husband's in dental school. Um, so we knew we were going to stay in this area. So I was like, okay, we need to find a job. And I interviewed at several different places, private practice, um, health departments. Um, and then with Aspen, 
and it was kind of during the pandemic. So that was kind of challenging. But when I interviewed with Dr. Cost, I mean, I really liked what he had to say, what his um, goals are for patients, what his outlook is on patient care, all lined up with what I wanted. Um, so it's worked out great. Um, and I have improved my skills tremendously just mm -hmm. from, um, and I'm learning new stuff all the time. So it's, it has been great for me. That's awesome. So as, you know, coming right out of dental school, you know, not doing residency, um, you know, you felt the support, what was it like initially for the first couple of months? Um, my training for the three weeks was really great. Um, I was with, you know, two dentists and they were so great. I can just knock ideas off of them, ask whatever questions I wanted. Um, I learned a lot and it wasn't you know, it was very a hands-on thing. If I needed help, if I didn't know something, I mean, it was very hands-on. Um, and then when I got into the Clarksburg office, it, you know, it takes a little bit to get your feet wet and get used to everything. Um, but now, I mean, I usually know how long it's going to take me for things. Um, I'm not really nervous anymore. Um, and like I said, like I've gotten to the point where I'm like, okay, I can do all of this and I feel comfortable with it, but now I want to do more. Awesome. Um, now, Dr. Curry, you did talk about you going into residency. Um, mm -hmm. I had a question posed of, um, did you feel like, you know, you needed residency or did you feel like you possibly could have uh, started with Aspen um, and they would have given you enough support to not go into residency? I know it's kind of tricky because, you know, you yeah. have there too. Um, I mean, overall, I think I'm glad I did residency. Um, but if I would have known that Dr. Koss was going to own this and he would have been my mentor kind of right off the bat, I feel like I definitely would have learned almost equivalent or more than what I actually learned in residency. I mean, I felt like residency helped me as far as I kind of already had an idea how to do some of the more difficult stuff when I came into the job and then working um, as long as I did helped as well, but I feel like it's just, um, there's ups and downs as far as their whole residency thing goes. Um, I, I wanted something that would pertain to private practice, which is why I did an a AEGD versus a GPR or anything like that. Um, but I feel like as long as you have a mentor, um, I mean, you could learn just as much, if not more than you could in an actual residency. And Dr. Ransom, I'm sure you could agree without, since you didn't do residency. Yes, I um, was not interested in, in especially doing a GPR, but it was just something that I was like, I, I don't want to. But I mean, that being said, I was in school and this is exactly what people would say is if you have a good mentor, it will be great. And I did not have a mentor at the time. So I just really am super lucky um, that Dr. Koss does own these offices because he has been a tremendous mentor for me. So speaking of mentors, you know, you didn't have one. Um, any suggestions on how to choose a lead dentist or a mentor or an office to work for? Um, because during an interview, you can't really, you know, see what their working style is, you know, or if it's similar to yours or if your dynamics can be good. How exactly did the both of you figure out, you know, what the, the next step would be, the right step? I mean, I feel like with me, it was a lot of trial and error because <laughs> uh, my office in South Carolina was just not, I mean, it sounded really good on paper, but then once I started working, it was just nowhere near what I wanted it to be. Um, the job I had here was good um, in the sense that I love my team. I love the people that I worked with, um, but I just felt like I wasn't growing any skills like I wanted to I kind of felt stuck um, there really wasn't any place for me to move up it was hard they really didn't give me a lot of support if I wanted to do CE classes or anything like that to try to improve um, so I th feel like that was the biggest thing you know is as far as I'm concerned yeah Dr. Ann. Um, well, like I said, like with the interview process, I did several interviews and then like 
my interview with Dr. Cost, I was like, yes, I agree with that. I agree with that. But then also like, even when I started training and watching him and asking questions, like there's really no question off limit. He's going to say like, this is why I'm doing this. This is, this is why, and kind of not just, you know, you see like he really does practice what he preaches. And along with the other doctors, like he owns several offices. And I mean, I've reached out to Dr. Curry um, and other dentists in his offices to ask questions too. That's wonderful. Um, so I just had this question posed um, for the both of you. While you were in dental school, did you ever imagine that you would be working in a DSO? Did you have any reservations or doubts about DSOs in dental school? And this is from a fellow WVU, so. <laughs> oh yeah, they hate DSOs in dental school. So <laughs> they kind of pound it into you to not go that route. Um, even but private practices will say that too. I mean, if you yeah. meet other dentists. Yeah, but take it from me, I've been in two private practices. Not all private practices are what they're cracked up to be. Um, you know, I like kind of being able to do my thing and go home and not really worry about the whole business side of it. Uh, in private practice, you really can't do that. You know, especially if you plan on buying into something or owning an office. Um, yeah, I mean, at first I had some reservations just because of what all of the faculty up at the dental school kind of tells you. Um, but once I got a chance to actually like talk to some people who worked for one, experience it myself, you know, you just really have to go and look at it for yourself because it's, for me, like, I'm the happiest I've been in my entire career um, currently, so speaks a lot. It's great to hear. Mm -hmm. I can say a lot about that too. Um, and I think it's different for everybody. I mean, you hear, oh, you're working at Aspen or, oh, but I mean, people ask me and I'm like, no, I love my job. I love the people I work with. I feel very supported. Um, like I said, I've grown my skills tremendously. I never thought I'd be where I'm at today a year ago. Um, but I'm so happy to go home at the end of the day. Um, I know I'm, I'm still going to get paid, which is, that's a big thing for me right now, um, paying bills and everything like that. Um, but then if I have a patient cancel, I can ask the front desk like, and see how a business is run too, um, because I have the time for that. But I've really been able to do my skills. I personally really like it. I mean, I come home and make dinner, play with the dog, hang out with Zach. So it's been great for me. Right. You have the opportunity to learn the business if you wanted to, but mm -hmm. you don't have to take it home, which is pretty awesome. Um, there's a whole, you know, um, people like to say, you know, with DSOs, um, you guys don't get full autonomy clinically. You know, it might be someone yeah. in court, like at the corporate side, that's dictating what you're supposed to do or budgeting or creating all these goals, or it's, another doctor creating treatment plans for you. And that's just what you have to follow. Mm -hmm. Is that what you guys experience? No, I have a hundred percent control over what I do, what I treatment plan, what I choose not to do. Um, you know, I don't do molar endo. I refer all of that out. No one has ever said anything to me ab about that. They want you to feel comfortable. You know, if you don't feel comfortable, um, you can opt to just not do it. Or if you want to get better at doing certain procedures, you know, they can provide you with um, people to help you learn more. So um, yeah, I mean, I have never, my last two practices, they controlled what I had on my schedule, what I treatment plan. This is not, this is not the case. So. And the treatment planning is a lot like dental school, except it's, yeah, you know, it's not a three hour appointment. It is 45 minutes. I mean, so I can spend, I can spend as long as I want with the patient, but it's nice. Um, we have x-rays, we have an intraoral scanner. Um, I can look at everything before I go in and show the patient with the scanner. Um, but that even let's say, I were, all in. yeah, yeah. And, um, let's say the other dentist might treatment plan something. Um, maybe I see the patient and I am like, eh, I don't know about that. I don't have to do it. And I don't, I don't feel bad about it at all. I just kind of explained to the patient, like, 
oh, I'm seeing this. I want to, we're going to change it to this, or we're going to do this. Um, and I haven't had any issues whatsoever. And I haven't felt pressured to do more. Right. I think it's really what you want to do. Like I said, I got to a point where I'm like, okay, I know I can do more. I want to do more. So I want to learn more. Yeah. I think that's huge. And, you know, from that, I just got an, another avenue of asking questions. Someone just emailed me a bunch of questions. And the biggest concern is the transition from dental school to becoming a dentist. Uh, obviously everyone here, all the participants are, um, our dental students. So how does the stress of working as a dentist compare to that out of dental school? Um, well, it kind um, of I happened more worse. <laughs> <laughs> kind of <laughs> happened more recently for me. Um, I mean, at first I was like, oh no, like now I have all this responsibility. Um, but it's really the things that I would get worried about in dental school are like, oh no, like this is going to happen. What if, what if something wrong happens? I've had so many complications and I just, you're so honest with the patient. Sometimes I'm, I feel like I'm too honest and just bombarding them with a dental school lecture with all the information that I'm giving. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, this is, this is what's happening. This is what we're going to do. Um, and they're great. I mean, it's been so the biggest awesome. thing for me and that I've seen with new grads is just like learning. They're all worried about their speed. Um, you know, that's not something that you have to worry about. I mean, you can take as long as you want to for procedures, just make sure you're comfortable. Um, you know, you never want to rush through anything just to get it done. So you want to make sure you do a good job for the patient. You want to make sure you're happy with the work that you do too. So um, I feel like that's what I hear most from new grads is just, they're so worried about building their speed, the speed, speed will come with time. So, you know, you guys are used to taking three hours for an occlusal filling. Um, you know, that'll, that'll all come with this, however long you end up practicing for. So. And the offices are understanding that, you know, yeah. if you have a new grad starting. That... Right. They don't expect you to do, you know, you can take, if you want two hours to do two fillings, you know, you can take two hours to do two fillings. They're very, um, you know, they definitely work with you. They don't try to rush you through anything. And right. you just kind of start to learn how I'm, I'm to that point recently that I'm, I can look at something and know <laughs> how long it's going to take me. But at first we just kind of had to keep watching. So we would give, you know, my office and me, like we would give more time for certain procedures. And then I realized like, Oh, I'm done 30 minutes before I thought I would be done. Um, and then you can learn sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we reevaluate it every six months or so. Oh, mm -hmm. nice. Nice. So you talk to like front staff and like mm -hmm. the office manager. That's awesome. Um, someone asked, you know, with Aspen Dental, and I know you, one of you had mentioned, you know, Itero scanners and everything. Do you have all the technology that you could ever want slash need? Yeah. We just got a cone beam CT scanner in our office. So we do all of that stuff. Um, the intraoral scanner we should be getting next month just because we're a new office. The Clarksburg office already has all of that stuff. And then if there's anything you want to order, I mean, they'll let you order it. You can order whatever you want, basically. Yeah, you know, with the ordering, I've had this asked often. Um, do you, does that come out of your paychecks? Ordering of it doesn't come out of my it doesn't come out of my paycheck, not our so it comes out of your offices like monthly production so you just have to make sure that you have the funds to do that um you know i've ordered stuff on my own before um but as far as like stuff for the office like you're allocated a certain amount to kind of use towards like ordering but um i think dr cost just ordered us like eleven thousand dollars worth of implant stuff last month and i mean it's not hitting you personally. It's not. No, no. That's awesome. That's good. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's like a concern because I've heard that often. I don't know if it's during dental school. Yeah, it doesn't come directly out of, out of your paycheck. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. What is this? Um, what is the patient population like at Aspen? Um, does it range from minimal needs like a profi? to dentures, et cetera. And yeah, it's kind of all across the board. Um, you know, we'll see people who don't have a cavity, only need a prophy. 
We see people who need full mouth scaling and root planing. We see people who need full mouth extractions, upper and lower dentures. So, I mean, we definitely have a wide array of people that we see. Yeah, I think I have done, I mean. I think it depends on the area too, where you're at. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Around here, it it could range from anywhere. And a lot of times, Mm -hmm. you know, if somebody needs full mouth rehab, um, they may go for dentures and not. Yeah. Not that. I mean, like that's just here. Um, yeah. Um, but no. I mean, I've done every aspect of dentistry since working. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, you know, I'm from Michigan and I've heard doctors from here or Ohio or, you know, West Virginia, they all talk about, it, it just really depends on the location. Yeah. Um, it, yes, we have some of our locations in more metro areas. Um, you know, Morgantown's a, Morgantown's a very, you know, popular area too. So mm-hmm. that would be completely different from another office that's one hour away. Um, mm-hmm. So it really depends. Uh, so yeah, thank you guys. Um, someone asked, do you think that by joining a corporate office or a DSO, you decrease that ratio um, of, so I guess the, the beginning of the question is they say that several years of general dentistry is equivalent to a year of specialty experience. Do you think that by joining a corporate office or a DSO, you decrease that ratio and get the experience faster than those who join a private practice when it comes yeah. to maybe endo and all that? Yeah. Definitely. Yes. I have, yeah. I have several of my classmates in private practice and whenever I get together and talk with them, um, I'm doing a lot more Mm -hmm. than them. And is it something that's just because the opportunity is there or the private practice owners aren't allowing newer grads or their associates or dentists not to do those? Or do you know, I don't know if you've seen a pattern. They just don't really have, like in my situation before, I just didn't really have a good mentor system set up uh, you know there really wasn't any where for me to learn how to do new kinds of procedures um you know I've been with Dr. Koss for almost two years now and he has probably taught me more in those two years than I learned in four and a half years of private practice so um you know I feel a lot more confident in during tour eye removal different kind of surgical procedures um it's just whatever you want to learn to get good at, I feel like you have the ability to do that at Aspen more so than you would a regular private practice, unless you luck into some kind of private practice who the guy, you know, wants to take you under your wing and do all of that stuff. But that's, that's pretty rare to find. That's crazy and great for Aspen, but Mm. it's crazy that, you know, the the differences in experiences. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. So I guess this goes along with this la- the last question. You know, if I work for Aspen or any DSO directly after I graduate, do they teach you things like molar endo, surgical extractions, and implants? Um, they said, I kind of feel ready to go into a practice, but I feel like what's taught in dental school is pretty basic and I really want to learn mm-hmm. advanced techniques. Yeah, they, I mean, they have resources and people to talk to for each one of those so if you're interested in learning more they'll definitely provide you with ways to get better at that stuff um and we have brand specialists too so yeah mm-hmm. um we have and we have endodontists and oral surgeons um that uh, implant specialists and all that yeah right. i mean there's always somebody to contact if right you want questions or want to learn how to do a certain procedure Perfect. Um, so another stigma, um, I, it's kind of going along with another question I asked in the past about, you know, the speed and keeping up with treatment plans, uh, treatment plans, sorry, not plans. Um, how was it hard to get used to treating so many patients if you are treating a lot of patients and, um, can you really get to know each patient? Oh my gosh. Yes. You definitely get to know patients. I saw one of my favorite patients today. So yes, um, I definitely think that um, 
at first it was hard and sometimes still, so there's like a new patient column. So it's, it's only new patients who are coming to the office. So that's where they come and they get um, x-rays, the intraoral scanner, the hygienist sees them and the dentist sees them. So it's really that comprehensive exam um, and consult to see this is where you are. This is what we can do to get you back in health. Sometimes that's exhausting for me um, because it's, <laughs> It, it just, it's a lot of mental energy, looking at x-rays, planning out treatment plans, like before I go in with the patient and then presenting it to the patient. Um, sometimes like that really does exhaust me, but it's nothing that I never like leave the office and think, oh, what a terrible day. Like, it's not that. <laughs> but you feel like you have the ability to like, if you have that patient that like really wants to talk to you for like I don't know, 20 minutes, I don't know a time, but you know, those, those longer, you know, it, it happens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't have anybody breathing down your neck saying that you've spent too long talking to a patient. If anything, like they want you to make sure the patient understands ev like all aspects of their treatment. You know, I would rather spend more time explaining something to somebody than leave early and have them be clueless when they go up to the front desk for their consult and you know they have no idea what they're what we had talked about so um so it's yeah not I, mean, I, I don't think that that's an issue okay cool so it's nothing like a mill like people have that that idea of like Aspen Dental or any other DSO you get your patient and get them out quickly no I mean they're really good about like putting a lot of new pay you know I don't know how they find all of these new patients but they do which is great because um you know uh, I mean, we probably in Morgantown, we've been, what did we do yesterday? 13 new patients yesterday. Um, we see a lot of people and, you know, they keep scheduling. They want to come. Um, a lot of private practices are lucky if they see two or three new patients a day. So um, it's definitely the business model that they have works. Um, and I think it's a great way to build a practice, build your skills, like, people skills, talking, clinical skills. So yeah, it isn't, there's a lot of new patients, but it's not a get in, get out kind of thing. You know, you, you want to make sure you comprehensively treatment plan everybody that you see. You want to make sure patients are getting the best possible care. And a lot of the patients that come to Aspen are not your typical like patients that go to private practice. I mean, yes, I, I do see, you know, younger people who, they don't really have a whole lot going on. Um, but then I also see people who haven't been to the dentist in years. Mm -hmm. And so now they're kind of ready. So you do get, I get a lot of patients that are really ashamed of their mouth and they are just like, Oh, I haven't been. And they know that it's bad, but mm -hmm. I mean, it usually it's not as bad as they think. Now with, you know, how you were talking about your schedules and, you know, seeing patients and everything, can you guys, um, I guess, collaborate and talk about how um, an associate schedule is different from a lead dentist schedule and how exactly that works in an office that has a lead dentist and an associate too. Um, I don't know if Dr. Ransom, if you want to explain what your schedule looks like. Um, um, yeah, I don't know how different it is now. I know kind of at the beginning, it would be, um, and I don't know how other Aspen offices are. I know this is just kind of how like Dr. Koss has his offices, but you know, the lead dentist would have kind of more bigger surgeries or, you know, something like that. Um, but a lot of times, I mean, if I saw a new patient and I was like, I can do this, um, whatever this is, we would get it on my schedule. Sometimes I would block out three hours for something um, because I'm like, I don't know how much time I will need. And that was never a big deal. But now I feel like it's pretty even. I mean, mm -hmm. they try to keep patients with the same provider. It doesn't always happen. Um, but I mean, what did I do today? I did extractions and inserted an immediate denture this morning. We did a, I cemented a crown. Um, what else did I do? Fillings. I mean, it's, it's just all across the board. Dr. Gray, anything to add to that on how the schedule? Yeah, um, I feel like in a typical office, the associate typically isn't as seasoned as the lead dentist. So sometimes they'll have some easier stuff on their schedule to start off. Um, 
my office, my associate is really good. She and I are basically on the same level of stuff. So we actually bumped her up to co-lead. So she's a co-lead with me. Um, so both of our schedules are really similar. Um, you know, we both do a lot of surgery. Um, I don't think either of us do molar endo. We just refer that out, but, um, yeah, we both do a lot of surgery. You know, if I have a question for her, I ask her, she helps me with stuff. I help her with stuff. So it's pretty even, even. And I think I'm a little different in the sense of, I know there's other offices where the associate does not do as much as I do. Um, Mm -hmm. so they will, they won't do extractions. They won't, you know, they kind of stick with fillings, crowns. Um, I've done a lot more surgery. Um, so I do a little bit more than some other associates. Um, and part of it's just because I, I wanted to. Um, and the nice thing I just wanted to add in is, you know, if you are in a private practice, um, you do often see that you're kind of fighting for procedures and mm-hmm. with Aspen Dental being an associate or a lead dentist, um, if the lead dentist has a more difficult procedure um, or something that you planned, but you just couldn't do, it doesn't take away from your compensation. The compensation besides no. like, yeah. rate is like, it's an overall, it's for all the doctors, it's the hygienists, it's everyone, it's a whole team environment. So you're not fighting to like, seat that crown if you can't seat it the insurance isn't going to no. be you know he gets it and she doesn't that kind of thing so yeah everybody everybody will bonus off of how well the office does at the end of the month um you know my previous practice I bonused off of how well I produced as a single doctor so I felt like that put a lot of competitiveness you know between the doctors in the office because we were all trying to to make sure you know we outproduced everybody else and that's really not one another you're all there to help the patients um so i definitely like that um you know they don't really look at each individual's production they look at the how the office as a whole is doing right right and i think that just it creates a a better plane or it does yeah yeah just zero competition is just better i feel yeah if I were a dentist. <laughs> um, perfect. Thank you. So um, what are you guys enjoying about dentistry? What are you guys enjoying the most? It's very general. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I just like helping people. Like people are really appreciative for the most part. You know, you'll get those handful of people that really don't care one way or another, but for the most part, you know, everybody whether it's the denture adjustment, you know, they're really happy that you're taking the time out of your day to help them. Um, crowns and veneers and stuff. I love doing that type of work to kind of doing the before and after because patients love that, but. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm also to the point where um, I'm kind of seeing my work over time and mm-hmm. I see patients kind of on a regular basis, which it's nice. Like I said, I get to know my patients when I see their mm-hmm. name on a schedule. I'm like, yes, I, I know who that is. I hope they're still doing well. Um, I just, I mean, I love seeing like my favorite patients, which I have a lot of them. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, so what challenges do you face um, on a day-to-day and how do you- And I've that? actually had some patients follow me from Clarksburg to- Oh, sorry, what was that? What- what challenges? Oh, yep. Yeah, sorry. What challenges do you face on a day to day, and how do you overcome them? Um, I don't know. I feel like some days are pretty easy. <laughs> um, I think just treatment planning. Um, you know that always gets a little tricky, especially with the more um. But at least you know I can bounce ideas off of other dentists that I work with. Um, I can bounce ideas off of Joel or any of the other doctors that work for the company. So I feel like that's probably the most challenging thing or how to handle like a problem when it pops up. But it's awesome. You have a good network though. That you can yeah. Always- yeah. But usually like, even if I'm kind of in a situation where I'm like, Oh, I, I have no idea what I, it's not that I don't have no idea, but like, I don't really know what the best way to go about this is. I mean, I can always call Dr. Cost. I've, I've called 
Dr. Curry, Dr. Kane, um, just to kind of say, hey, this is this is where I'm at. Um, and most of the time it works out perfectly fine. But the support system is great. I mean, like I said, even on my, you know, not the best days, um, I still have such a good support system. Um, so is there anything that surprised you um, when you started to work um, at Aspen Dental, something that you didn't an anticipate and um, you learned once you started to work for us for some time? It could be positive or negative, but was there anything you didn't anticipate um, when starting with Aspen Dental? Um, I mean, I know this is pretty generic, but I really wasn't anticipating for me to like it as much as I did. I was um, about to say that. <laughs> yeah. It's just, I don't know. It's just really nice leaving work and feeling good. And I can go to work and not be stressed out about going to work. You know, I enjoy what I do now. I love what I do. So um, I think that was the most surprising thing out of it because I didn't feel there for a while. I kind of felt like I was in the wrong field um like oh my god I majored in the wrong thing but um yeah because I was just to the point where I I hated going to work every day and you know I think that's the most important thing you have to love what you do so and I mean I thought that way right before I graduated too like what did I get myself into I'm not going to be able to find a job I'm not going to like this um and I mean I do I really like my job and I'm sure like everybody gets tired of me saying it, but when they ask, I'm like, no, I really like it. I'm really lucky to have this job. I've learned so much. Um, and I don't know really what my future holds, but I mean, I wouldn't trade this time for the world. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear. I think it's, especially, you know, like we talked about the stigmas of, of corporate DSOs, Aspen, all that. So, um, that's really great to hear. Um, what is, so going along with this, what's one thing you really like about Aspen and one thing you'd like to improve? Um, one thing, I mean, I really like, and we kind of did this in school, but like with the treatment planning, you know, the patient's going to see the hygienist first. They're going to get their perio under control. They're going to make sure they can maintain their teeth and the, their oral health before we do anything extensive. Um, and I just, you know, I think that that's important in general. Um, so I really like that, just kind of how that system is. Um, I don't, I don't really know what I would change. <laughs> not, not off the top of my head. I'm sure I've thought what I would change before, but. Uh, yeah, I would probably say the treatment planning, um, not a lot of private practices do comprehensive treatment planning. A lot of them will do limited exams and just kind of treat like per tooth. Um, Aspen doesn't do that. You know, I look at the whole mouth. I treatment plan based off that. If a patient needs scaling and root planning done, they have to have that done before they have any kind of restorative work done. Um, if they don't want it done, then that's, you know, we're not the office for them. And so, um, you know, I like that we just don't do things on people just. Um, thank you for that, um, for both of, uh, I can't even talk right now. Thank you for answering. Um, so this is, uh, I've never had this question before. It's pretty, this is a good question. So what if a patient's really rude? Oh, did we lose Dr. Curry? Um, oh, hi. No, okay. I'm here. Okay, perfect. So what if a patient is really rude? How do you deal with them? Do you have to deal with them? What do you do? <laughs> it happens. <laughs> you know, not everybody's nice. Um, you know, I just try to be as nice as I possibly can. If they're, you know, I'd rather them yell at me than my, my staff. Um, Cause you know, my staff is just trying to help. So, you know, I've told I told a patient last week who got angry with one of my assistants, you know, you can yell at me all day, um, but you're not allowed to speak to my staff that way. So um, we have dismissed people before. Um, we just kind of have to take it like patient to patient basis. You know, some people are just frustrated. So I feel like if you 
hear them out. Um, you can kind of de-escalate the situation before the appointment's over. Um, but then you have those people that are just mean. <laughs> so, and you um, have patients. Uh, I mean, sometimes you have patients with like unrealistic expectations. Right. Um, and when you get that combination and, and it comes with time, like learning how to kind of identify that, um, because the more like that I practice, the more I can really set the patient's expectations in the initial treatment plan appointment. Like, let's say that they're getting dentures. I can set their expectations based off looking at the anatomy in their mouth, based off what I know about dentures, you know, set their expectations and let them know, um, as best I can, or even just with teeth with poor prognosis that they want to hold on to. Um, I try and set their expectations to the reality of what it is. Um, and that usually, you know, usually I don't have an issue, but we have had rude patients before. Um, and typically if they don't like the way we do it, you know, we always say this is the way we do it here. But if you would like to go somewhere else, you're more than welcome to. How does that affect your day? Like um, your, the rest of the day going home, does it impact you? No. Um, I mean, it's annoying. You know, I tend to like think about stuff longer than I should um, worry about things longer than I should too. So, I mean, yeah, sometimes if someone's like super rude to either myself or my staff, I will think about it later that evening. Um, I mean, you just have to learn to let it go because you're not going to make ev everyone happy. Um, you just have to do the best job you can do. And if someone doesn't like it, you know, there's a hundred other dentists out there, they can find someone that will do whatever they want. But, you know, I'm not that person. I think Aspen doesn't want you to be that person either. They want you to be your own dentist. They want you to treat them plan the way you want to treat patients the way, you know, you think you should be treated. I'm not going to risk my license just to do some crazy thing that someone wants me to do. Um, which I also had to tell somebody today. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, good advice. Um, so how fairly do you get compensated for the time you put in? What are your hours during the week? Do you have a good work-life balance? I know both of you had mentioned, you know, when you get home, you don't have to worry about work. Um, but mm -hmm. is it a good work-life balance with the hours? And does it feel like the compensation is, is, fair to what you're doing mm -hmm. yeah I mean I definitely don't feel overworked um we have one late day which is Tuesday so we work nine to seven um if there's two doctors typically we'll do like a split shift kind of thing so a couple days a week I'll come in early and then I leave early my associate will come in later and leave later so we'll just kind of alternate those days um one Saturday a month but she and I alternate that month so really I work one Saturday every other month, which isn't bad at all. Good work-life, work-life balance. Dr. Ransom? Um, I, yes, I definitely think so. Uh, the hardest part for me is my office is 40 minutes away, 40, 45 minutes away. So that's a lot of time in the car yeah. for me. Um, if I was closer, if I was in Morgantown, um, then I'd be living the dream because it would only be 15 minutes away for me. <laughs> Yeah, it, it helps <laughs> not driving a long time. <laughs> I feel like everyone wants to be in Morgantown. I think I get messages from every student yeah. in the world about Morgantown. Even mm -hmm. when it was built, I heard a rumor that Morgantown's being built. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> it exists. It's, it's a, a hot commodity. <laughs> <laughs> um, so someone just asked, so what are some of the craziest expectations patients have had? Oh, um, I think everyone wants to know crazy stories today. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've had people with nothing but root tips come in. I mean, completely just flush to the gum line and they're mad because we can't save their teeth. I mean, decay everywhere. And I mean, that's probably some, uh, the lady I had today, again, she broke a tooth to the gum line the only option is just to take it out. That wasn't the option she wanted to hear. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of all the, 
Or, I mean, I will say perio is super bad. Like you see yeah. it so much more. Um, I have the only patient that I don't like seeing her name on the schedule. Um, I mean, literally her teeth, I thought were going to come out in the impression because she had lost so much bone. Um, and she has just these unrealistic expectations of like what, what her state was um, with her mouth. So that is people don't realize that that's, they have a hard time comprehending the bone loss. And like I said, we see patients who haven't been to the dentist in years. Um, so you really see it. Wow. Yeah. I had one lady who she was on my schedule because she said her crown came off. Well, it was her entire tooth that fell out. Um, and she wanted me to glue it back in again, not, not going to happen. <laughs> it doesn't happen a lot. Like you don't get patients with unrealistic, you know, it, it doesn't happen ev every day. Like, you, you know, I can probably count on one hand in the last like year that I've had somebody who was just like, not even like, we just were not on the same page at all, but well, that's good. The dental students don't have to freak out too much. <laughs> no, it isn't that bad. <laughs> I've had, I had one lady, I guess the kind of actually, no, this actually happened recently. I had a, I had a patient come in and his bridge fell off and he only had five teeth on the top and he had this full arching bridge and there was decay under, you know, all those teeth. And that's why it fell off. And I said, no, these teeth need to come out. You're looking at a denture. And he wanted to get implants, um, but his sinuses were super low. So I wrote him a referral to the oral surgeon um, because I kind of explained, you're going to need sinus lifts. It'll be extensive procedures. Like we're not going to be able to do that here. So I don't see him for months and months and months. Well, he comes in the office just last week and he went to Mexico to get implants um, and they are atrocious. I don't recommend doing that. And they're all failing. Um, and um, and he so he shows up and I'm like, well, this is where you're at. Like, you really need to go see who put these in. Um, but they need to come out. Oh no. So yeah, it's oh it's like you want to say I told you so, but then it's like heartbreaking and you're like, oh why? Okay. Yeah. Oh goodness. Um, I only have a few more questions left. Um what advice would you give a dental student to be prepared coming out of dental school? Especially, we already talked about this, being afraid of speed and true implants and keeping up. But I guess aside from that, what advice do you have for a dental student um, coming out of dental school? Catherine, you want to You're fresh yeah. out. <laughs> I would say just be yourself. Um, I did several interviews looking for jobs. Um, there was one that I thought I was 100% going to get because that interview, I was like, this is great. I did so good. Um, and I didn't get the job and I'm really thankful I didn't get the job now. Um, but I would say definitely be yourself and, and don't be afraid to ask questions. If you find that it's hard for you to ask, maybe you found a mentor, maybe it's hard for you to ask questions or you're seeing stuff. You're like, Hey, I don't, you don't have to agree with everything, but you, you know, you, you definitely get a sense of this is clinically acceptable and this is not, um, trust yourself, but be yourself and be able to ask questions and people should be able to give you an answer, mm -hmm. especially the people you work with. Dr. Curry, have you interviewed associates being a lead dentist um, with Aspen Dental? Have you been part of the process? Um, so I helped interview for the Parkersburg office. Um, and so I guess what, what do you- People are really nervous. Just don't be nervous. Yeah, just try to not worry about it. You know, don't put too much stress on, on, on yourself. Um, and, you know, while I know dental school is hard and it sucks, but- just try to learn as much as you can get experience. You know, if you're not that great taking teeth out, spend a little more time over an oral surgery. If you want to get more experience with endo, like try to go to the different departments, but um, yeah, definitely just don't stress out. Um, and I mean, for me, I had a lot of people in my interviews ask like, what are you good at? What do you like? Um, and coming out of dental school, I was mediocre at a lot of things. Yeah. You really don't and know. I, 
and I didn't know. Um, but now I, and I mean, when I was in school too, I hated extractions. I mean, I was just, yeah. like, I'm not good at them. Um, I, I mean, I'm probably, I can say this with pretty good certainty. I'm one of the top people in my class taking out teeth. Like I've probably taken out more teeth than anybody else in my class. Um, that's kind of where I'm at right now, but I mean, it's, it's kind of how it is. Um, yeah. It's definitely not the same as dental school. And I will say, you know, in my residency, I was the only one from WVU. Um, all of my other co-residents, I had four other co-residents. Um, they were all from different schools. And I do feel like WVU prepares you better than most dental schools to work outside. Um, so you may not think you're good at something, but you actually know a lot more than a lot of the other dental schools are teaching you. So you do, um, you, you know, like this, this is what's acceptable. I mean, even though when you're in clinic and you're more prepared than you think you are. Mm -hmm. And I mean, reach out to your classmates, even the people that you graduate with. I still talk to my friends on a regular basis, reach out to the people you work with um, that are a few years ahead of you too. Great advice. Great. Thank you. And so Dr. Curry, are there particular things you look for when you're interviewing an associate um, or just again, have them be them set themselves? Yeah, just be themselves. Um, you know, definitely if you're not comfortable doing something, I would say that up front in an interview. Um, I feel like the, the thing I see most is just people are just scared, scared to death whenever they interview. So take a breath, you know, everyone's new, everyone starts out somewhere. So just make sure that where you're interviewing, you feel a good vibe there. You make sure that their um, values line up with yours. Um, you know, and if you make a mistake, it's okay. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, before I started practicing, I always thought, you know, oh, I'm going to find a practice and that's the one that I'm going to stick with throughout the rest of my career um you know it took me two offices you know before I kind of found somewhere that I'm really happy with so you know things don't last forever so yeah definitely don't put so much pressure to make the such a permanent decision right right out of the gate so but I mean, right. even if you find like working for a year somewhere, I mean, even if you don't like it at all, you're going to learn more than yeah. you think you know, or, or more than you think you're going to learn um, for your next stage in life. Thank you guys. Thank you for that. So I just had a bunch of questions emailed to me, but I'll, I'll just have, I'm going to pull one from it so we can um, wrap this up. Um, what is your go-to strategy to ease a patient that's really anxious or has had a dramatic pre previous experience with the dentist that they were going to prior to even, or when they were younger, um, what is your strategy to, to ease them? I just try to make them feel as comfortable as possible. You know, really it takes one bad experience for someone to be completely terrified to go to the dentist. Um, you know, we don't offer nitrous at my office, but I do prescribe Valium a lot. So I'll have them take that the night before in the morning of and let them know, you know, they're in good hands, just reassure them that they're making the right decision that you're going to take care of them. Um, you know, and it usually works out pretty well. And I, um, I hum a lot actually every time I work. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't mean to, I picked it up in dental school. I just started doing it and I get a lot of patients comments they feel super relaxed about that. Um, and usually I'm just relaxed. Um, we listen to music and I, sometimes I even like walk them through the procedure. Okay. This is what mm -hmm. to expect. This is what you're going. This is what you should be feeling. Um, this is all completely normal. If you're uncomfortable, tell me I'll stop and just really reassure them. Right. Thank you for that. Um, I know I said that was the last question, but this is the last question. Outside of dentistry, who are you and what do you like to do? Oh God, I hate these questions. <laughs> I don't do anything. I come home. <laughs> um, I love to hang out with my friends and my family. Um, I like anything active outside, working out. Um, I don't know. That's about it. I mean, 
I'm old I now. I have a new like dog that. mom Super. as of Thanksgiving. So hanging out with our dog a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, do yeah. Dogs are a lot. Traveling. I'd like to travel. COVID kind of put a stop to that though. Right. But, of course. What's yeah. the next trip you guys will, or, or you'll go on Dr. Curry when you can? Well, my husband and I, we, we got married last year. So we moved our honeymoon back to this July. It was Ireland and Scotland. Scotland, but that doesn't look like that that's happening because the UK still shut down. Mm. Europe still shut down. So we're probably going to have to postpone that. Um, so I don't know. Orlando, maybe. I don't know. My yeah. husband's a huge Harry Potter fan and he's never been to Universal Studios. So I'm thinking about I haven't, taking it. That, taking that's going to be my next trip. I need to go there too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, who's, what's your, um, pup's name, Dr. Ransom? Nora. Nora. Oh, well, wonderful. Don't miss her bedtime. <laughs> well, we will conclude so Nora can go to bed. And, um, I just wanted to thank you both for answering all these questions for all these students. And I want to thank the students for asking the questions and posing them for Dr. Ransom and Dr. Curry. So, um, if you guys do have any further questions, feel free to email me and I can get in contact with the two of them, um, you know, and get those answered for you. And, you know, we do offer shattering opportunities. So I think that's a great thing to experience, especially if you're a D4 um, and, you know, you're wrapping up your, your last year or so. Um, definitely reach out. We can figure something out with um, either of them. And yeah, so thank you so much. And you're uh, welcome. Anything else you guys have to say or we're good. Yeah. If you guys have any questions, reach out to her. She can email myself or yeah. Dr. Ransom. We'll definitely answer everything yeah. we can for you. Perfect. Thank you guys so much and have a good rest of your evening. Thanks. You too. Bye.